Hello, ladies and gentlemen, I'm Phil Svitek and joined alongside by my friend Eric Awusu. Now, of course, that is not the reason he is here. As you know, if you've been following the show, I like to bring on uh, various people in the entertainment industry that I happen to know, highlight what they've been up to, where they're going, uh, the techniques that they're applying. And so that is what brings Eric here. Now, Here's something interesting, and maybe you can clarify this for me, Eric. Mm -hmm. So I know Eric as generally a performer. Um, I've not seen his stand-up, but I know he does stand-up. And most of what I know him from is the Black Spider-Man parody series. And we've done a couple of various uh, short projects together. And so he's always kind of in front of the camera. And yet... I'm told that that is not your main thing and that you're, you're not actually an actor. So can, can you like give us some context of, you know, just, just all of that. And I'll start to break it down too, because um, I'm very curious about that whole progression of things. Yeah. Uh, so I'm primarily a comedy writer. Uh, I like to say I'm a writer who can pop up in things. I don't even like to say that I, I'm an actor or I can, I can act because I can't. Um, I have zero acting chops. I just show up in things and somehow remember lines. But uh, yeah, I'm primarily a writer. I've have had I made my mind up to be a comedy writer when I was like 19, 20. And that's what brought me to L.A. I came out here to write for television. That's my main thing. And I was fortunate enough to be able to write on a season of a Disney Channel show uh, back in 2017. So, you know, just and then I've sold some stuff and I'm always chasing the next writing gig. So that is that is my spiel yeah i mean you know what, what what is so fascinating to me is that like and what i respect about you is that you're a you're a yes guy and not in the sense of you'll just do whatever but i think you know what's worth and the people that are worth latching on to and you know so that's why like it doesn't matter if you're acting in it or not it's like if someone thinks that you would add value to it and you respect them then i think you take is that a fair assessment of you yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, I, I like that kind of redefinition of yes man, uh, someone who's willing to say yes to doing fun and valuable things, and not just someone who will say yes to you know inflate an ego. Yeah, that that that's me. And how how do you like decide what you want to be be a part of and things like that? Because in particular, you work with our dear friend um, Khalil Abdelrahim, mm -hmm. and and um, you know that uh, obviously the crew that made Black Spider Man. But you know what. What makes you gravitate someone to someone versus not? Yeah. Uh, if I like the person, <laughs> I'm more than likely to say yes to working on a project. Um, I, <laughs> so Khalil and I, so we met through mutual friends at like a hangout. And then we ended up working on the same project, this like Martin reimagining back in 2017 that was done in Hollywood at Second City. So after that, and you know, the, the creator of the show after the end of the show told the whole audience that I wrote the script in a day, uh, which is true. I wrote the script in 24 hours, but like he said that and then Khalil and I got to talking and he was like, hey, man, Eric, I have some ideas for projects. And I'm like, yeah, OK, everyone has ideas for projects sure, whatever. <laughs> but it ended up being Black Spider-Man and Shoot Your Shot and other things. And then we collaborated and, you know, the rest is history. Uh, we're inseparable. So um, I have to like the people I'm potentially going to work with. And then also I have to like the project because I, I there have been times where people I do like are like, hey, I have an idea and I want you to be a part of it. And they tell me the idea or I read the script and I'm like, thanks, but no thanks. You know, So it, it has to be that combination of things. I got to like the person or the people involved and I have to like the thing that they're doing. Yeah. So in terms of what you mostly write, um, I imagine it's more comedy based and things like that. But like if you know, do, do the old Hollywood, this meets that, like, what's your ideal, like, and is it TV shows? Is it movies? You know, is it mm -hmm. sketch comedy? Is it, you know, like shoot your shot is, a, um, I don't know. It, it's akin to like, you know, room Raiders or something like that. You know what I mean? Like, so I'm, I'm curious, like what genre tickles your fancy? Yeah. My main thing is uh half hour comedies. So whether it's a single cam, like, you know, uh, an, uh, chewing gum or the office or it's a multicam like, you know, Martin, Fresh Prince, Family Matters. Uh, I love half hour comedies. My dream show to create and have on TV would be Martin meets Atlanta. So like a black production through and through with black 
you know, people starring in it and being funny, but then also serious and tortured and imperfect and fun loving, uh, but definitely silly. And, you know, people falling through tables sometimes, <laughs> like reaching over couches to try to like, you know, playfully attack their friends. So, like I like silly, but I like stuff of substance and value and that's thought provoking. So my dream show would be like Atlanta meets Martin, wherein there's like some heady, uh, uh, um, uh, what's the show that Atlanta's Peaky, not Peaky Blinders. What's the show that was on Showtime and it just came back? It's super oh, yeah. weird. You're not uh, talking about Twin, Jack's, Twin Peaks. Twin Peaks. Yeah. Twin Peaks, yes. So, yeah, it would be a heady thing like Twin Peaks and like a silly That's, that's very thing. heavy. That's a, that's, yeah. a, that's a big dichotomy of like, you know, you went Twin Peaks. That, you yeah. know, not because there's heady. But even if for people that haven't like necessarily seen Twin Peaks, that's like out there. <laughs> yeah, super out there. Yeah. And I like weird shit. I just wrote a thing with Khalil where some weird shit happens, but it starts off innocuous and familiar enough. So I like that. I like mixing worlds and genres that traditionally haven't been seen before. And like, because I like them, you know, I like chocolate and peanut butter, but I'm sure the first person to put them together other people were like, what the fuck are you doing? <laughs> so. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good way to look at it, certainly. Um, and in that sense, I, going to the, the, the sitcom, right? I want to I nail down. I'm just kind of curious for my own sake, if anything else. Laugh tracks or no laugh tracks? Mm, are you a fan for, or not? Uh, it depends. It depends on the show. <laughs> there, there's a big debate over it, right? And, you know, um, the idea is that you shouldn't add a laugh track if it wasn't recorded in front of a live audience. At least that's like the, the, the mm. ideal theory. And yet so many of these shows, they just, they're like slap a laugh track in there, Make it, <laughs> you know? Well, it kind of, I mean, if it's a multicam multicam for, you know, people watching who might not know is uh, it's uh, like a, it's on a stage kind of sort of, and it's filmed with three or four different cameras to get all the angles and it operates. It's almost like a filmed play is a multi-cam. A uh, single cam is one camera or two cameras shooting at the same time, you know, over people's shoulders, but it has multiple locations and sets and there is no laugh track, laugh track. And I guess multi uh, multiple cameras for a laugh track or laughter being live recorded is because a multi-cam is so, so much like a filmed play. Like you're supposed to get the live reaction from the audience enjoying the show, the episode, uh, whatever word you want to use. Like back in the 90s and the 80s, so many TV shows started with blah, 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 was filmed in front of a live studio audience. And that's how you knew it was official. And they didn't have like a laugh track or at least a laugh track on every episode. So it, it depends on what type of comedy you're, you're doing. You know, a laugh track on The Office would feel weird. And no laugh track on Martin <laughs> would be kind of unnerving. But for these different arenas, they fit and they work. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, and also speaking of like the old sitcoms, um, are you excited that people are discovering? And, and if so, like what, what show in particular? Because with all these streaming platforms, you know, HBO Max, Netflix, all that, um, a lot of the old stuff is resurfacing and being far more accessible than it ever was. You know, if you caught it on TV, that was it. If you didn't, you know, you just kept it moving. Or you had to buy the box set on VHS or DVD. Yeah, exactly. So uh, I'm curious, like, what what sitcoms are you excited to see pop back into, like, the the narrative of culture? Yeah. Uh, well, Martin is on HBO Max, and now it's accessible to me because I have a friend's HBO Max login. I wasn't going to get my own BET Plus login. Um, so it's nice to see everyone able to watch uh martin and the parkers and my wife and kids and tv shows like that i remember especially during quarantine a lot of gen zers uh became familiar with the office on netflix and and were really deep diving into that show um and yeah family matters is on hulu and you know other places so i'm, I'm glad these shows that i grew up with are accessible and, and i'm excited for stuff that's out now like there's a miss pat a uh, sitcom, like a multi-cam show. I think it's streaming. Miss Pat is a Black woman uh, stand-up comedian and actor. And so she has her own sitcom. 
And, you know, she plays the matriarch of a black family and she's got a teenage son who's, you know, running amok. But they curse and they're super vulgar on that show because it's on streaming. And so it's like an adult sitcom and not necessarily a family sitcom, which people find refreshing. And then the Upshaws is very similar on Netflix uh, that has Mike Epps on it. And I hear it's really good. Um, so I, I like that streaming has allowed for kind of old meets new and that we have this old sitcom format, the live or film stage show uh, with modern day sensibilities and modern day technology being on streaming. And, you know, they've got the modern day situations and stuff. People are on the phone too much and this, that, and the third. So I, I like I like the old sitcoms, but I like that there's kind of a, a a demand for new stuff to come out too. Yeah, absolutely, right. I mean, that's the the catch of it is you don't want to live in nostalgia. And what's it, what's been interesting for me on a personal level is I do like to revisit a lot of these. A because of the nostalgia factor. I won't lie about that, but also it's interesting to see like just the evolution of it all. Um, mm -hmm. You know, of like. It's like anything, if, if you revisit it years down the line, you're a different person. So you can kind of observe how you changed and how you viewed the, you know, whatever it is differently. Um, and also just humanity. And also at the same time of like, what is, I, I mean, the beauty of sitcoms is, yeah, minus like the technology and so forth, still all the same crap everyone's always dealing with, you know, <laughs> the, the husband and the wife have an argument, the kids did something stupid. You got the, you know, sometimes you got the one, uh, you know, overzealous kid that's always, always overachieving, making it, you know, it's just, mm. hence sitcom, situational comedy, <laughs> put, them in the, <laughs> put them in the same situation, see how they react, you know, it's mm -hmm. brilliant. Um, so shifting gears a little bit, um, what's like, you know, going back to how you got into writing, you know, how you study writing, like, I'm, I'm curious, you know, your evolution, how you approach the craft. You know, are you reading scripts daily? You know, do you just watch like, you know, just it's a lot there, but feel free yeah. to tackle that. Yeah, um, I'm not reading scripts daily. Absolutely not. Um, <laughs> the last script I read was Swan Song, which is an Apple Plus movie uh, starring Mahershala Ali. Beautiful script. Haven't seen the movie yet, but I liked reading the script. Um, do you usually try to read the script before or at, like how do you normally do it in an ideal world? Um, a lot of times I read the script if I don't have immediate access to the film or TV show. So it's not necessarily a read the script first, then watch it. Sometimes it's just, oh, it's behind a paywall, but the script is right here for free. So let me just do it that way. Like years ago, uh, when I first started, you know, like in college, I read the screenplay for The Social Network and mm -hmm. I still have never seen the movie. But on Netflix, I, I hear. Yeah, it's, it's available now, but uh, <laughs> there's a lot. There's a lot on my list of things to get to. Um, so, no, I'm not reading scripts every day, but I try to read like weekly some scripts uh, to, 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 to be in the know and to, to see techniques and how people are formatting things and break down acts and structure and you know, pacing and all that. Because it's important for me and it informs my decisions and my tactics uh, when I go to write my scripts. And actually yesterday, um, I was revisiting a script I've been working on all of quarantine, uh, opened up the final draft document of it, I was going in tinkering with it, and then opened up my Google Doc of notes from the last reread of things to go back and change and adjust and tinker with. So that's, that's a fun process for me right now, um, working on this feature script. Is it, I mean, it's always interesting to me, um, because I follow like screenwriting Twitter, right? Mm -hmm. And people argue all day, every day. And yes, there's definitely rules and you have to like format it in a specific format and there's a craft of storytelling. But really it's kind of funny, like all, all the stuff of you're supposed to do, not supposed to do, it comes down to just don't have a boring script. Yeah, right. don't have a boring script, yeah. And don't right. have typos. Like <laughs> that's just the main, those are the only two constants, I think. Fair enough. Yeah, because yeah, I mean, everything, everything gets... Everything that gets made isn't necessarily the original version that got sold. So like good scripts have been sold and been turned into bad movies and then vice versa. So like, like you said, just make sure it's not boring. And I'm saying make sure I don't have no obvious typos and then 
you've done all you can do. The rest is into the rest is in the universe's hands. Yeah. And, and that's the crazy part to me. Like, you know, when you, when you talk about typos, I'm just amazed at the amount of people, cause that's something you can easily control. You know what I mean? It, like mm-hmm. we could sit here all day of like what makes a good script, what doesn't. And I'm a firm believer in just, just, just do the things you can control. Yeah. <laughs> um, like it just saddens me to no end. Like the, I have a friend who, um, put out a book on Amazon and the formatting's all off and this and that. And I'm like, but you can control that, <laughs> you know, whether you write a good book or bad book, like that's fine, whatever, you know, that's subjective ultimately, but like, I, I can't even read the damn thing. And it's not because it's a fucking postmodern book. <laughs> right. So, yeah. I don't know. Um, like what, what sort of, pet? I, I guess that's a good question in terms of what sort of pet peeves do you notice about, uh, you know, that, that just tick you off about people in our own industry? Mm, um, needless racism and misogyny. Uh, those are definitely top tier pisser offers. Those, yeah, um, we, we went deep with that. That's I would call that more than a pet peeve. That's, that's <laughs> you know, uh, systemic. Uh, yeah, I, you know, just just larger yeah. issues than just pet peeves. Yeah, but even on an individual level, people partake in these behaviors and those are clear indicators of oh this is who i'm dealing with and you know the late great Maya angelou said when someone shows you who you they are believe them the first time so like you know people show you who you, they are all the time if you listen if you actually pay attention so that you know if people are making crass okay so i watched um licorice pizza um the pta movie and you know, I read all the things about it beforehand, and I was like, let me see just how bad I think this film is <laughs> myself. And of course, you know, it was interesting, shot well, edited well, well acted. The basics covered. However, <laughs> really gross plot point with the, you know, the high school person dating the person in their 20s or whatever, fall in love, whatever you want to call it, still gross. But then also needless racism <laughs> that didn't add to the story didn't really, wasn't needed to help paint the picture of, oh, this is the 70s. And like, there was no comeuppance for the person who kept being racist in multiple scenes. Like, it was just like, why is this here? So like, yeah, it might be the last PTA movie, Paul Thomas Anderson movie I ever watched, but stuff like that is like, why are we still doing this? And why did you feel the need to do this? And uh, so I've not seen the movie. So does it like... Cause it doesn't draw attention to it. Like you said, there's no comeuppance for what happens. It's just, it's just part of it. It just happens. Correct. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and what, like, so I guess, I, I guess that's a selfish question, perhaps like what is the difference between something that's like artistically driven that is making a point about that versus like, Oh, someone just didn't realize it. And they, you know, they're just dropping in whatever joke and think it's funny. Yeah. I think purposeful, illustrations or depictions of something like let's let's keep it in the realm of racism uh of course this movie's set in the 70s in the united states of america so it's not like i'm saying no movie ever should have any racism depicted ever that's not realistic but there's a way to depict it where it's like what are you saying about this even if they were saying this is the right way to do things in my mind's eye that's an, an artist makes a statement about things and attitudes and behaviors of their time or a time but the way it was done in licorice pizza was just like oh here's some racism i think it's it, it's it might be funny to people who are from in that era and it's like it I, it wasn't and like people are still racist against people now in that way and it's not funny now and i'm, I'm sure it wasn't funny back then so i don't understand why he decided to put that in the movie and have it happen multiple times. And I, I, I wanted to try to get it, but then the payoff kind of happened and it was like a, but it felt real flat and it was like, it wasn't worth it, bro. Like you could have done without this and it still yeah. would have been a gross B movie that shot really well with a good budget and Bradley Cooper's in it. So it gives it some more credits, but yeah, you know, it was just not my cup of tea and I don't yeah. think it was done well. Yeah. Um, like I said, I mean, I haven't seen it in that sense, so I can't comment. Um, but it is interesting to me, like um, the one I can think of, like 
uh, the last duel, the Ridley Scott movie, there's a lot of, you know, that's, that's basically a movie about rape. And what's interesting about it um, without spoiling anything is it, it almost highlights how far we haven't come. Mm. You know what I mean? Like it, it, yes, it's set in whatever medieval times and yet, and they talk differently and whatever, and it looks different, but at the same time, it's like, this, this is what we're dealing with today. <laughs> You know, that's the crazy part about it. So like that to me, like if, if, if that, again, I haven't seen it, but like, it sounds like that movie didn't hit that for you. You know, it, it, there was no connective tissue apart from like, oh, um, I can use a blanket statement of, you know, using racism because racism existed in the seventies. So let's just go mm-hmm. with it. You know? Um, yeah. Directors be wildin'. That's all I can chalk it up to. Yeah. What's, um, cause I, you, you know, um, it is this topic that, I'm always willing to learn and whatnot. And I've had discussions with friends about this of like, cause it's not, a, you know, it, to me, at least it's not enough of like, Oh, well, we'll just hire this, uh, you know, black writer or a couple of black actors or whatever. Like that's not, to me, that's not what it's about. It's about putting people in the power positions here and there based. Um, so that way the decisions that are made aren't, you, you know, that, that like whoever it, like, let's say like the head of casting, you're, you know, you don't just have a white person doing all the casting, but like, all right, well, I guess we need a couple of black people. So let's put them in. It's like, no, you can, you can have someone in that position on the behind the scenes, not just in front of the camera. Cause I think, I don't know, I, I guess if I'm going anywhere with it is I think it, there's a comfort, especially on white people's side of like, oh, there's so many black people in front of the camera now that everything must be good. It's like, no, no, no. It's also behind the camera. That's the thing. So I know there's not really a question there, but I don't know. Can you speak to like that as that idea of it? Yeah. The idea of inclusivity, <clears throat> I, even in your, your wording of the, the query, putting positions of putting people in positions of power, you got to think of who's traditionally historically in Hollywood been in positions of power, mostly straight white dudes. And so it's it kind of as the system is right now, or has as things are laid out right now, it, it falls on those people who are the CEOs of Netflix and Warner Brothers and Lionsgate or whatever to actively put people of color in positions of like casting or on the board of you know chairman or whatever, so that there is a more inclusive uh, uh, layout of who is making decisions and who's profiting off of everything and, and what have you. So for example, going back to Swan Song, I read the script, it just said a dude, uh, no specific race or ethnicity or size or build or whatever, just charming dude. Um, and, and casting and Apple made the decision to make it Mahershala Ali. Like, because a lot of times when there is no description of exactly what the main characters look like, people who are in casting, not always maliciously or intentionally exclusive, but might be like, oh, I'm a white person. I like Bradley Cooper. I like Channing Tatum. I like Robert Pattinson. Let's get them in there. That's who I think of when I think charming guy. Um, so they have to actively be like, oh, well, let's expand the lens of, you know, not just white faces. Who else is charming in Hollywood? There's Denzel, there's Yaya, there's uh, Mahershala, there's uh, Brandon T. Jackson. There are a bunch of people, but you have to actively seek people like that out. And of Black women and women of color, Latinx people, all that for not just in front of the camera, but also the decision makers, the executives, the casting people, the financiers, you know? So it, uh, we need inclusivity in front of the camera, behind the camera, but even like, you know, working the camera, the, DP, the DPs, the directors and stuff like that. So it's just all around. Like the people who are running the show are mostly predominantly white dudes. Even if white people are 60-ish percent of the population, that's still 12% black people. And 12% of black people are not in positions of power in Hollywood. <laughs> so even in terms of like the, the, the percentages of people in the country, this shit is not fair, balanced, and equal. And it's not because white people are better at making decisions in movies. It's just because historically white people have held the reins and been you know, like not inclusive. So that's more of what needs to happen. Yeah. And I think the big thing that turns 
that, that, that becomes an argument for any of this stuff is that it's like a zero sum game. And it's like, it's, it's not a zero sum game, you know? And I hate, I don't know about you, but I, I'm so like over the narrative of Hollywood is so out of ideas. It's like, to me, Hollywood is just scary. Like there's, so, I, I, I could th- we could throw a rock right now and hit an idea. You know what I mean? And <laughs> doesn't mean they're all going to be good, but there are a lot of, there's a lot of talent out there you know, and as you said, from all sides, like there's great casting directors, there's great cameramen, there's great writers, um, you know, actors, so forth. And it's like, why, why, why are we like in this depleted zone of like, oh, no one can ever come up with a new idea. It's like, stop. Yeah. Well, there's a lot of reasons as to why that is. It's like people get hired and fired in these positions of power all the time. Presidents of networks get fired, they leave, they go to smaller ones, bigger ones, depending on the success of their last thing. There's a saying, you're only as good as the last thing you did. Um, So because they're scared of the next thing they're working on, not doing well, a lot of times they'll go for what they think is a sure shot. Oh, let's revive a series that had a fan base back in the day and people would at least be interested to see how the reboot is done or the reimagining is done or... Uh, you know, what stunt casting we do, what person from the original thing is still alive <laughs> that said yes to being in this new iteration of it. So people, you at least cover your asses there. So people are scared. And I think that's one reason is because they're not sure something will do well or not. But, you know, new things have done well all the time, i.e. the thing that they're trying to reboot. At one point, that wasn't a reboot. At one point, it was an original idea that someone took a chance on and then it went on to become popular. And then it did its thing whenever it came out. And then years later, someone's like, "Uh, I need a guaranteed win. Uh, Let me reboot (laughs) Back to the Future. I don't know. But but the the funny part, like, I I mean, I can bring a whole stack of case studies of reboots or whatever that that don't do well. Yeah. yeah. You know what I mean? So it's like, come on. That person got fired. (laughs) (laughs) Like the idea that it's a surefire bet. That doesn't yeah. exist, you know? Yeah. But also it's not, it's not a new practice because, you know, the Wizard of Oz that we're used to um, was a reboot. There was a Wizard of Oz movie in the 20s. It was black and white, entirely black and white. There was no color portion of it. So, you know, it's not a new phenomenon, but it just feels like it's new because we know of all the new reboots when they get announced or picked up or greenlit or whatever. Yeah. Um, related to that, and kind of what we've been talking about going on, like, how do you look at appropriation? And because even in the sense, um, uh, so like people tell Christopher Nolan as this like genius of originality, right? Take, an, take a movie like Inception, it blew people's minds. I'm like, that movie's Paprika, which is a Japanese animated movie, mm. and quite frankly, done better. And he lived like, that people have done side by side comparisons of like hallway scene and this and then that. It's like he literally just, I mean, in essence, kind of ripped off Paprika. Mm. And so it just boggles my mind um, that A, it's not talked about, right? Um, mm-hmm. But but just, yeah, you know, we just take and as long as it feels like an original idea, we're cool with it. Yeah, I'm writing down Paprika to watch it later because I haven't seen Inception. But I am interested to see Paprika. Uh, I, 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 I sent it to Khalil and his mind was blown. <laughs> I love you know, that. What I love yeah. about Japanese movies, especially animated ones, it's like you're either on board or you're not and they don't care. <laughs> They're going, <laughs> you know, and if you're confused, if, you, if you're like, that's weird, they don't care. You're out. <laughs> you better buckle up because this train's not stopping. <laughs> it's not. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, okay, appropriation. Um, I think a lot of times what we get caught up in is cultural appropriation. Where, for example, a Gwen Stefani who rolled around with Harajuku girls as backup dancers or just part of the posse. Uh, and everyone was like, ooh, that's cool. She's rolling with a bunch of Japanese girls. And it's like, this is a whole culture in and of itself in Japan and other parts of the world. But this person is just kind of having them as decoration and not even really telling the world like, hey, this is who these people are. This is where they're from. I'm super inspired by them. We, we, you know, they're from Japan or whatever. Like, she's just like, these are people I'm around. So that a lot of times people get mad at cultural appropriation because they don't, the person who's doing it doesn't give credit to the thing that they're appropriating, where it's from, 
And a lot of times the people who had been doing the thing don't get the credit for it. Don't get nearly the attention or payment or endorsement deals or whatever from it that the main person is, is doing. So for example, like a, like a Gwen Stefani and the, the girls from Japan or a Kardashian getting, you know, thick braids on her head and be like, this is cute. And it's like, everyone's like, oh my gosh, it's so cute. Like put her in all the commercials with those braids in. Meanwhile, black women and, you know, women from the Caribbean and Africa have been doing that. And they're told it's unprofessional. It looks gross. It looks dingy. It's awful. It's not straight laid white hair. So then like that's what gets people mad about appropriation. But in terms of film, like a Nolan and Paprika, you can sometimes get away with it if, you know, the fan base of like a Paprika isn't yelling out like, he stole this from Paprika. How dare you give the maker of Paprika their, their, their cut of Inception, <laughs> basically. You fucking filmed their movie and recreated it. Uh, and, and so as long as someone's willing to admit, hey, I was inspired by X, Y, Z. This is where I got this idea from. Like, or it's a clear, uh, uh, it's a clear kind of re doing or retelling so everyone knows oh this is he got this from that like in rap a lot of times rappers do that jay-z will do that he'll say notorious big lines that everyone knows is from notorious big so they're like oh okay jay-z didn't come up with you know when the henny's in the system ain't no telling will i bang him will i diss him that's a biggie line he's just nodding to biggie so if it's a clear nod that's fine but oftentimes it's not someone's taking something that they were inspired by or just doing a straight rip off of it and doing it and putting it out and being like, aren't I smart? Look at what I did all by myself. And then, you know, that's what gets people mad about appropriation. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, one of my kind of viewpoints too is like, um, you know, instead of appropriation, like appreciation, you know, like if, Mm -hmm. you know, whatever culture you are supposedly supporting, it's like, are you buying from the people from that particular culture, you know, like if, if I wore, I don't know, a Latin shirt, am I getting it from Walmart or am mm. I getting it from, you know, a Latin Taylor? Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. You know, that to me is like the, uh, an easy delineation in a sense. I like that appropriation versus appreciation. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so we haven't talked about your stand up comedy, you know, um, cause that's, you know, for, if people don't know, I mean, it's a different art form to write for, you know, TV for visuals versus a stand-up act. Mm-hmm. Uh, how do you view the, like, what are the biggest differences in your mind? Uh, well, with stand-up, in terms of me being a performer versus me, a TV writer, uh, I, stand-up is much more accessible to me to just go out and do. Like, I can just go out and do a show. Um, but with TV, I got to get right, hired as a writer or sell my own TV show and then like staffing and all that can take years. Um, but in terms of writing stand-up versus TV writing, it's very similar. Um, with me, I like to write joke by joke by joke. So I have a joke bank full of different jokes. Like I keep all my jokes and notes in my Google Keep app. So I don't have like, this is this 10 minute set. This is that 10 minute set. I have. I got this joke, this joke, this joke, this joke. This weekend I'm doing seven minutes. I'm, he, these are my seven minutes worth of jokes I'm doing this, this week or whatever. So knowing that I try to not have jokes that last too long. Sometimes if it's a story bit, it'll go two, three minutes. But for the most part, my jokes are like a minute, minute and a half or less, you know, quick, full of punches, full of like things to incite laughter or, uh references i try not to spell out things in my jokes i try to just like present stuff and if people get the reference they get it and it's almost like an inside joke with a room full of strangers and i love doing comedy like that and watching comedy like that um like i have a bit i did recently about uh (laughs) i say i i believe in abstinence only education i believe that we got to teach the youth to abstain for as long as possible from marriage, <laughs> just don't do it. Like, you know, it's a trap. If there was a 50% chance that, you know, my booster shot could have gone wrong, I probably still would have done it, but I wouldn't get a giant cake for people to eat with me with a figurine of me and the syringe on top of the cake, like, you know, to, you know, to, to spell out the perils of divorce and stuff. 
So I never say di- the word divorce in my joke, but I lay out all these things where people are like, I know what he's talking about. Um, so, and I can do that in TV writing, but for TV, you also have to be, you have to write so that it's, it, it's funny on paper and then people can imagine seeing the actors or the gags or, you know, the, 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 uh, the props. Um, so you have to write TV scripts with visual cues too. And in the slug lines, you describe what we're looking at and what's happening. The car is this color. The, the jacket is this color with feathers coming out of it. Like you gotta describe all this in detail so people can imagine it before you go out and shoot it. Yeah, and, and I imagine like the, cause it's always so interesting what actually works, right? Um, there's the famous friends thing of pivot, pivot, pivot. You know, mm. just, just in the dialogue, all it just says is pivot repeatedly. And yet it's one of the funniest bits on TV of like that, of just three people essentially trying to move a couch upstairs mm-hmm. and just yelling pivot at each other. <laughs> um, so it's, yeah, it's always intriguing how that like works and, you know, the, the, the mechanisms to try to get that from the pay, you know, to, as you say, for people to visualize it, to get to the end product. You know, I'm, I'm sure there's some people that read it. They're like, I don't get it. How's this funny? <laughs> right. Yeah. It's like, trust me, the actors will figure it out on the day of the director will guide them. It'll be funny. Yeah. 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 Um, awesome. Well, is there anything else um, uh, that you'd like to share before we wrap things up about, you know, anything you're up to um, down the line that you'd like to be up to? Mm, um yeah, you know, just a little bit of manifestation. Hopefully this comes through. Uh, a friend of mine who's been working on a Cartoon Network show for the last couple of years uh, reached out today about a potential writing gig on an animated show. So she's going to recommend me for it. Hopefully, you know, I get an interview or something like that. And, you know, that could be a dope thing to work on. Um, I don't think it's the show she's on, but it, it might be in the same wheelhouse. So that would be cool. Um and yeah, I think I have a couple of stand-up shows slated for February. And so hopefully I'll populate the calendar with more coming up. And yeah, just continuing to write, work on stuff with Khalil. And more than likely you <laughs> come in and lend your directorial eye and your steady hand to hold the camera. Um, yeah, and just trying to continue surviving. It's still a panorama. So <laughs> doing my best still to wash pan. my hands and keep my germs to myself. <laughs> Absolutely. And uh, what's the easiest way for people to like track all this stuff? You know, when you say comedy dates, like how do they, Mm -hmm. how do they know? Yeah. uh, I put most of my stuff on my Twitter and Instagram. Uh, I'm on Instagram at eric.kay.owusu. Twitter is at owusu kid. So yeah, I put most of my stuff on there and yeah, you know, fuck with your boy. (laughs) There you go. (laughs) Absolutely. Awesome. 